بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing with our journey through the series of the heaviest deeds, and that is pertaining to good character and mannerisms, which are taught to us through Islam. And we find, and we will come to find even more, that the reality is that every aspect of our lives, Islam has teachings pertaining to good manners for that area of our life. So that is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we're going to talk about today is pertaining to a reality that many of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala engage in. And that is the issues pertaining to traveling, the adab and some basic fiqh pertaining to safar. So throughout the world, people are traveling. And some of the issues that we're going to mention today, for you yourself, they might be a bit abstract because you're living in modernity. You're living in luxury. So you may not be able to relate to that particular issue right away. But the reason it's important for you to know is number one, it's knowledge, it's ilm. So you need to know it. Number two, don't ever feel that your situation is permanent. Things are not to be taken for granted. Societies, countries, regions, they all change. The situations change very quickly. You can find that within a space of two to three years, a nation goes from being rich and full of having modernity and luxury to being very poor. It can happen, it can take place. So these issues that we learn are very important, even if you cannot relate to them directly straight away. So we know that traveling is something which is very difficult and arduous for most of Allah's creation on this earth. When they travel long periods of time or long periods throughout the earth, it's not easy for most people. It's something which is difficult. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, that traveling is a portion of torture or punishment. It prevents one of you from his normal habits of eating and drinking and sleeping patterns. So when you have completed your objective from the traveling, then return as quickly as you can to your family. This was the advice from the Prophet ﷺ. And it is the reality, as I mentioned, that many people, when they travel, it's something which is extremely difficult and not easy. So when somebody is traveling and leaving his family, what is his family supposed to say to him when he is traveling? These are the words that are to be said to the one who is traveling. And the one who is traveling himself, he should really ponder and think that, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that this is something which is difficult. And this is something which is torturous upon me. And it's not guaranteed that I'm going to return. So I have to ensure that when I'm traveling, I'm leaving my family, I leave them on good terms. Any issues that I have between anybody in my family, I need to correct that. Don't think that every time you leave your house, whether it's a long journey or a short journey, that is guaranteed for you to return. So how horrible is it? How not nice is it that if you've had an argument and that was the last thing that you had with your loved ones in your life? So when you leave your house, ensure that you leave based upon love, reconciliation, based upon comp compassion, even if it's just a daily journey, because you're not guaranteed that you're going to be returning to your loved ones in the, in the house, right? So ensure that you leave upon good terms. Ensure that you complete the rights of those whose rights you have taken from debts or other things, arguments or anything of that nature. طيب. Also, when the person is traveling, before he travels, what is he supposed to do? Istikhara, right? You make istikhara, you pray, istikhara, which is that you're seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should I take this journey on this airplane? Should I take this journey on this day? Is it beneficial for me? So it's always beneficial and productive for us to make istikhara with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if there's anything which is negative in terms of outcome, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change our direction for us, make it difficult for us to fulfill what we were trying to do. That is the reality of istikhara. When you seek istikhara from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are asking Allah, if this is good for me, then facilitate it. And if it's not good for me, then take it away from me and replace with that which is better. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do for the person. So it's imperative that the person 
not only makes istikhara, which is the first and foremost, but also makes shura. Shura is that you discuss with the people of knowledge. It doesn't have to be religious knowledge, but people who have traveled to those lands beforehand, or traveled to that geographic region, or know about that place. You should speak to them and take advice from them. What do I need to prepare? When is the best time to go? What do I need to be aware of, etc., etc. Tayyib. Another thing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, as in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that it's important for us not to travel alone if we can avoid that. Especially if it's in the night. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَوْ the Prophet ﷺ said, had the people known what difficulties lie or what tribulations lie ahead for the person traveling alone, from what I know, then the person would never travel alone at night. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I know the reality of traveling alone, especially at night. It's extremely difficult and the person shouldn't do it. And the reasons are obvious. When you travel, you come upon so many difficulties and so many challenges that can you know, arise suddenly. So if you have those around you that are righteous and good friends or good companions, then they will help you, inshallah, to seek the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you travel in a group, as is recommended, recommended by the Prophet sallallahu what is it that you should establish when traveling in that group? Leadership, the Amir, right? You should establish the Amir. The Prophet Sallallahu said in Abi Dawood, إِذَا خَرَجَ ثَلَاثَةٌ فِي سَفَرٍ فَلْيُؤَمِّرُوا أَحَدَهُمْ That if three of you travel, in a, if three of you get together and travel in a journey, then they should establish one of them as the Amir. And Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, in fact, he went as far as saying that this is something which is wajib, obligatory. طيب. Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said that obedience to the Amir is not absolute, right? It's obedience in the things which are directly pertaining to the benefit of the journey. And that is the job of the Amir. The Amir is not to take the position to feel haughty. And yes, I have been chosen as the Amir. La, it's the complete opposite. The Amir has taken the position and now he has the most responsibility on his head. He's the one who has to be the foremost in fulfilling the needs of the people. He's the one who has to look out for the benefit of the journey and to, to ensure as much as possible that everybody's needs are facilitated and achieved. So the Amir is chosen and the Amir to be chosen is of course, if you can, somebody who is righteous, somebody who has knowledge. But the most important thing is somebody who understands the nature of traveling and to where they are traveling to. So as we mentioned, the things that are required will be facilitated. The Prophet Sallallahu as in Bukhari and Muslim, also from the Adab al-Safar, he mentioned pertaining to the queens of our palaces, our palaces meaning our homes, and our queens meaning our women folk. They literally are our queens, right? That's how we tr treat them, as gems. Something so valuable. We don't want the, them to be exposed to the whole world. And in fact, even till today, anybody of royalty or anybody of importance doesn't travel alone. How do they travel? They travel with an entourage. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. لا يحل لإمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن تسافر مسيرة يوم وليلة ليس معها محرم. The Prophet Sallallahu said, it's not permitted for a woman that believes in Allah in the last day, that she travels alone for a distance of a day or a night, more, more than that or less than that, except that she has with her a mahram. And the mahram is loosely translated as the person that she cannot marry from the male relatives, right? Her father, her brother, her son, etc., etc., her uncles. So these are the ones that are there to protect her. And the woman, she is to be protected. That is her right. That is what must be given to her to, to establish her worthy status. One may say, and also to further this, the Prophet ﷺ, imagine the situation, right? The Prophet ﷺ is gathering conscripts for jihad to go out and defend the Muslim lands and to defend the blood of the Muslims. And amongst those conscripts that the uh, Prophet ﷺ has gathered, one of them, they mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, my wife is going on Hajj and she's alone. The Prophet ﷺ said, go to her, idhab fahuj ma'aha. Go, leave the jihad, which is such a lofty and valuable act of worship in the sight of Allah Azawajal. Leave this and go and accompany your wife for Hajj to show how important it is 
that the woman, she doesn't travel alone unless there's a real need for her to do so. So in today's situations, people have come with fatawa because they say, look, if the woman is on a ship or she's on a plane, is she alone? Is she alone? She's not alone, right, Salman? So you can take her to the airport. You can ensure that she gets through all the checkings. And you can watch from the window, ensure that she gets to the plane. And then on the other side, you have somebody do the same. When the plane lands, you ensure that from the moment she's coming off the plane, she's observed. Somebody's with her. What do you think of this? It doesn't establish the mahram reality or the maqsad, the objective from the mahram whatsoever. Because what is the objective from having the mahram? Protection. Where's her protection when she's alone on the plane or on the ship? She can easily be harassed. There can be a drunk passenger, a passenger who just doesn't like the way she dresses, right? It can be any emergency situation can arise. So who's going to protect her and take care of her in that situation? So that is the reality of the mahram. So this fatwa, it doesn't apply and it's not applicable in the adab of the traveler. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which day would he prefer to travel on? Huh? Ayyu ahsant. In Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrated, Kana Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yuhibbu in yakhruj yawm al-khamis. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would love to travel, or he would prefer to travel on Thursday. But this is something which is mustahab, right? It's not something that we can restrict people to, obviously, because Islam is a very natural way of life, and to restrict people to traveling on one day only will be something quite absurd. But however, this was the preference of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which day are you not recommended or allowed to travel on? Either allowed or not recommended, not you, somebody else. Huh? Ahsant, Friday, right? Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, idha nudiya li salati min yawmi al-jum'ati, fas'aw ila dhikri Allah, wa dharu al-bay. Oh, you who believe, if the call to prayer is given on the day of, judge, on the day of Juma, then rush to the prayer and leave alone the trade. So where's the evidence? What's the word of the lala from this verse in the Quran to say that you cannot travel when the time of Juma is there? When the call to prayer is made for Juma, rush to the prayer and leave alone trade. Is trade something permissible? It's something which is permissible and encouraged. However, when it gets in the way of you praying Salatul Juma, you are supposed to leave it, right? And rush to the Juma. Likewise, if travel is going to get the, in the way of your Juma, you are supposed to leave it. So for you to travel after the call to prayer on Salatul Juma, it's impermissible. It's not allowed for you to do so. However, if you were to travel before that, right, then this is something which is disliked, makru. It's, you won't be punished for it, but it's something which is disliked. Why? Huh? Because you're going to miss a virtuous act. You're going to miss the virtuous act of Juma, right? You're going to miss the virtuous act of praying Juma. That's why it's recommended for you not to do so. What is the words that you say when you are traveling on transport? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Nearly said it as nice as the uh, stewardess says it on the flight. Just like Allah khair, right? So this is what you say when you're traveling, whether it be boat, car, and there's a varieties of the dua, but this is the simplest one that you can say. Subhanalladhi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu muqrinin wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. Tayyib? When you're traveling, what gift does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you? Shortening the prayers is from that as well, the rukhsa. You get to shorten the prayers if you want to do so. Huh? Acceptance of the dua. As in Abi Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, Thalatha da'wat mustajabat. La shakka fi hinna. There are three dua that are guaranteed for you to be answered. And there's no doubt in that. Da'watul walid, the dua of the parent. Wa da'watul musafir, and the dua of the one who is traveling. And the dua of the one who is being oppressed. So how many people waste this when they are traveling, right? They're enjoying their time on the journey. There's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your time as long as it's in halal means. But that's all they do. You're just having fun, fun, fun on the airplane, right? Thinking about the food, thinking about the movies, thinking about the sports programs. Take out enough of your time so you can make dua to Allah. You are flying under the heavens. 
close as high as you will ever get to the heavens. And Allah has guaranteed for you your dua is going to be answered. That's where your focus should be. Because it's not often that you make these long journeys. It's not often that you're a traveler. So when you are a traveler, focus and realize the situation that you are in so that perhaps you may gain from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With regards to traveling and taking a break somewhere or stopping at a place, and this is outside of travel also, what should be said? Ahsanta. The Prophet sallallahu said as in Sahih Muslim from the hadith where he said, man nazila manzilan faqal, whoever stops at a place, any place, and he says, a'udhu bi kalimatillahi, I seek refuge in the words of Allah, atamati, the perfect words of Allah, and the most complete, min sharri ma khalaq, from any evil that he has created, lam yadurhu shay, hatta yartahila min manzilhi dhalik, until he leaves that place. So Shaykh Ibn Baz was very particular on this dua. He used to say to people, wherever you go, make sure you say this dua. Anyone's house you visit, even when you're going to work, maybe sometimes, especially when you go to work, right? Protect yourself from the harm of people there. Wherever you go, wherever you're traveling, make sure you say this dua. You will be protected. I've seen a video of some brothers. They're proving this. They didn't intend it, but they were saying, they were showing that one night they slept in the desert. And underneath their mattresses, they woke up in the morning, they lifted up their mattresses. There was these huge scorpions connected to the mattress, how, clinging onto the mattresses. Not one, but many. And they were saying, this is the power of this dua. We slept on this mattress with the scorpion underneath, and it didn't touch us. So from Allah's fadl, and the Prophet Sallallahu mercy is that he guided us to such deeds that we should say such a thing. What is the mannerisms pertaining to returning from a journey? What should the person do when he's returning from the journey pertaining to him and his family? You're returning from your journey? Inform your family in advance. The Prophet Sallallahu recommended this. Why? So your family can prepare for you so that when you come home, you find your beautiful, beautiful wife. You don't have a panic attack. She doesn't have a panic attack. She looks more like the mother-in-law than the wife you left. It's better for you and it's right for you to inform them that you are returning at such and such time. So they have time to prepare themselves and to get themselves back in, into order for you. What is the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ used to do upon returning to the town or the city from a journey? What is it that we should be doing as narrating Bukhari Muslim? Huh? You should go to the local masjid if it's easy for you on your way. It's Anas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he would return from a journey, he would, the first thing he would do was go to the masjid and pray to Raqqa. Why do you think this is? <coughs> shukr, right? Give thanks to Allah. And here's a beautiful point. This is the reality of shukr. Many of us, we feel it sometimes in the heart, the lucky ones amongst us. The least of the shukr that we give is we just say it upon the tongue. But the Prophet Sallallahu is narrated not only in this hadith but in Bukhari and Muslim. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقوم من الليل حتى يتفتر قدماه أو حتى تتفتر قدماه That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to stand the night prayer until his feet would become swollen and cracked. فقلت له يا رسول الله لما تصنع هذا O oh, Prophet of Allah, why do you do this to yourself? And Allah Azza wa has forgiven you all of your sins. All of your mistakes have been forgiven for you. He said, Should I not then be a grateful slave? So the true reality of shukr is what? Is to worship Allah Azza wa So this is the true way that shukr is shown. That's why when the, when the Prophet Sallallahu would return from journey, he would pray. And if we want to give shukr, the reality of shukr is to pray and to do other acts of good deeds. When are you considered technically to be a traveler? Is it once you put on your clothes? Is it once you packed your bags? Is it once you made the intention? Intention. Is it once you hugged your family and stepped out of the door? What are you going to say at the back? Intention, good. You don't speak. Zakallah. <laughs> Masha Salman's a top student. Okay. Brother mentioned Salman. What did you say? Ahsant. When you've left the confines of your city, when you've left the city, walls behind you, right? Your city is now behind you. That's when you are now considered a traveler. 
So the, the rukhsa of the siyam, okay, leaving alone the fasting and the uh, joining of the prayer starts once you've become a traveler, which is when you've left that uh, point from your city. The distance wherein one is to be considered a traveler. Any ideas? 80 kilometers tends to be the majority opinion. There is another opinion. Does anyone know what it is? Ascent. What's, con what's considered customarily the norm, okay, the urf of the community or the place that you live. And this is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. He said that that which has not been defined by the Sharia, then it's left to the norms of the people to define it, right? However, the, the better, I can't say that because I'm not a scholar, but many say that the better is to have this dhabit, is to have it defined as 80 kilometers because people differ from place to place and from time to time and it causes a lot of confusion. So when you have it fixed for you as 80 kilometers, that is something which is well and good. If one intends to stay for more than four days at his place of destination, what then happens? Ascent, ascent, zakallah khair. So if you have an intention that you want to stay at your destination for more than four days, then the moment you land at your destination or arrive to your destination, the rukhas of the safar, the, the permissions of the traveler stop for you. Okay? So you're then not allowed, like the brother said, to join your prayer, to shorten your prayers, right? If you intend to stay for more than four days. However, if you ended up staying for more than four days, but you didn't intend to do so, right? Then you can continue to join the prayers and take the other rukhas of being a musafir because you did not stay, stay there out of your own will. You were held back for whatever reason, right? Maybe you got sick or something of that nature. And that's how you understand some of the narrations like Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is narrated about him that for six months in Azerbaijan, they used to take the rukhs of the suffer but this was because they were prevented from traveling Taib and Allah knows best how long can the person wipe on his socks as a traveler and and three nights as in the hadith of Safwan ibn Asal and others very good which salah is not obligatory upon the musafir huh Salatul Jummah Salatul Jummah is this in all situations this is as long as he is traveling. However, if he stops at a place, then he has to answer the call, right? But whilst he's actually traveling, then it's not obligatory upon him. How would you pray the salah on a plane whilst you are traveling? You have to ask permission to stand and pray. This is the first thing. If they don't give you permission to stand and pray, you pray sitting, right? If you cannot even face the Qibla, you try to face the Qibla as much as you can. If you cannot even do that, then you pray in the situation you are in. However, there's an exception which Sheikh Uthaymin mentioned. He mentioned if it's from the prayers that you can combine, that when you land at your destination, you can combine the Dhuhr to the Asr or the Maghrib to the Isha, then it's better for you to delay your prayer so you can pray in the correct way with all the shurut and the wajibat and everything else. Tayyib, what do you say when the plane goes up or down? Or whether you are on land, are you climbing up or you are climbing down? So when you're going up, you say? Allahu Akbar. When you're coming down? Subhanallah. Okay? If you are praying behind a muqim, a resident, as a traveler, right? You are musafir. It's allowed for you to pray too. You come and you pray in the masjid behind a resident imam. What do you do? You follow the Imam and you pray full, okay? Tayyib, inshallah. This is the end of what I wanted to say today as a mulakhas of the adab of the uh, traveler, the musafir. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it heavy in our scale of good deeds. And I hope it was of some benefit. If you have any questions or clarifications, then feel free, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Naam.